Hello, and welcome to the Collider Podcast. I'm Collider Senior Editor Matt Goldberg, and with me is Managing Editor Adam Chitwood. Happy Christmas, everybody. And TV Editor Liz Shannon Miller. Happy Holidays. Uh, today, we are for our second episode this week, we are going to be focusing on the best television shows of 2020. Uh, I don't really watch that much television, so I'm going to hand this mostly off to, to Liz and Adam. The uh, waste of a pub. Why are we doing this? Get out of here, man. <laughs> yeah, people don't, people don't know what I think of the Queen's Gambit. <laughs> I just had to pull one <laughs> from the ether. There is a show uh, that you watch that I don't watch that I do want to ask uh, you guys to discuss later, which is The Crown. So. Ah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. The Crown. <laughs> but it wasn't like one of my favorite things. The show, anyway. the show you reviewed literally a month ago. <laughs> it didn't stay with me. It didn't Apparently. stick with me like it does. Um, it's it's a very pretty show, I guess. Um, so yeah, we're gonna just dive in and talk about favorite shows this year, and uh, it's certainly an interesting year for television. And sort of, we were able to sort of escape into things uh, before we get into the to the the best of the year. I was a little surprised. I don't know about you guys, but you know. We we were we were in the era of of peak TV, and the and the thing was like. I'll never have enough time to catch up with all these TV shows. And then the monkey paw curls. <laughs> <laughs> now we have all this time. I still didn't catch up with anything. All these shows that have been recommended over the years didn't catch up with a single thing. Was there anything that you guys finally got around to this year because you had time for it? Well, I mean, I'm going to full on note that I went one step further about a year or two ago. I said, it would just be great if all television production could shut down for three months. <laughs> I literally said that out loud once while waiting for an elevator. And I've, 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 I, I feel really bad about it. <laughs> uh, this is yeah, all your I, fault. It is. I totally take full responsibility. I, you know, I, I want to say yes. I feel like maybe I put in more time into checking out new shows but no i mean i think i think the stuff i was going to catch up on is the stuff i was going to catch up on but i also like watching tv all the time is already something kind of ingrained in my behavior so what about you adam i know there's stuff i just like i can't it's been such a blur like it blows my mind that next week is january and next week is 2021 um but my fiance and i like we did watch gosh you finally started watching Halt and Catch Fire. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the one that I was going to note that I've been watching recently. But like, as far as stuff that I've been watching, like together with my fiance and stuff, like we want to catch up on The Crown, but like we didn't get back into that. Um, dear God, I'm just blanking. Halt and Catch Fire is the one that I just kind of started like on my own recently. And it's a show that I had watched the first few episodes when it premiered on AMC. And I was like, this is a Mad Men ripoff. It was like literally they had Frankenstein, Mad Men and Breaking Bad and were like, and here's the show. Uh, and so I bolted. But then I heard it got really good. Um, so I just started it on Netflix uh, with season two. And I was like, oh, yeah, OK, this is very good. And now I, I'm I will... like super into it. So, sorry, I didn't mean to uh, jump in. No, uh, but uh, but I, I will say uh, when it, when the first season of uh, what, what, we, what we do in the shadows was running, I just didn't really get into it. Um, I, I knew people were really enjoying it. It just wasn't landing for me for whatever reason. But the spring, uh, right at the time of everything really shutting down, I did go back, rewatch season, watch season one, really got into it by the end. And then season two was a really strong season for that show. So I'm very, very happy with how that turned out. I did the exact same thing. We watched, we started watching what we do in the shadows almost on a whim. It was like, we were like, we're kind of out of things to watch. And like, I heard this is pretty good. And I also, I'm still like, I still stand by it. I'm not a huge fan of that first season. I think it's all right. And it has some good laughs every now and then, which I know I saw it said on a previous podcast and someone like yelled at me and said I was an idiot for saying that. Um, but it, like just didn't, <laughs> it, it just didn't work as well for me, but I do think season two was really fun. The, uh, what's it that Jackie, what's it? What's the Jackie. Daytona. Jackie Daytona episode was uh, incredible, I thought. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just did a whole mini arc in a single episode, um, which I thought was really fantastic. Yeah. Um, I'll say also uh, one show that I had not checked out properly when it premiered back in April, but finally watched uh, just like a couple weeks ago was Unorthodox. Uh, surprise Emmy contender Unorthodox was really, really special. I don't know if it makes my top 15 just because it really feels more like a Essentially, it feels like a movie 
as opposed to a collection of small films. Uh, but uh, it's uh, yeah, I, 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 that was, that was, I think my big like quarantine victory is I finally watched a, unorthodox but going back and rewatching like the really like the really big stuff like i know i have family members who have caught up on the wire um i gave some serious thought to a sopranos rewatch that may still happen i mean you know, quarantine's not over yet guys <laughs> california is a it's a cesspool of disease we're never le- we're never leaving our houses ever again i'll finally get to finally rewatch the sopranos from the beginning the way i've meant to <laughs> i did uh uh, I marathoned The Sopranos the first time I watched it, and I don't recommend doing that because uh, it will send you into a deep, depressive spiral because <laughs> that show is very dark. Oh, yeah. um, I can't remember if it was during quarantine or not, but I know it was this year we watched Veronica Mars for the first time. Uh, oh. I, I enjoyed that. Yeah, the, 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 I mean, uh, did you... I mean, because I, 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 Veronica Mars is fascinating just because the first season, I feel like, is one of the perfect seasons of television yes, I that's agree. been made in our history. And then it just progressively l- lower and lower returns until you get to that season four finale, which is just woof. N- <laughs> woof. But I'm glad you watched the first season. Like, cause yeah. the, I, the first season is just so good. It is. It's super fun. And I, you know, looking, I don't know, not to digress, but looking at the history, I could tell they were in a tight spot in trying to like, you know, the, I think the network was changing and they were like, how do we keep this going? So. Yeah. So let me ask you guys this, maybe this this speaks to the best TV of the year, but I'm also curious for your philosophical uh, take on this topic of the idea of making the top 10 list. And I say this as someone who is currently hard at work fin- finalizing her top 10 list for this year of television. Like for you, do you try to like, is it, does it just always have to be the very best television or the very best film of the year? Or is it just like something where, or do you have like your, I don't want to say your pity slot, but you're like, uh, no, no, no one else is going to put this show or this movie on their list. So I'm going to go ahead and do that just to make them happy and to make me happy. Um, I, I mean, Matt has come, a good philosophy on this. I, I mean, yeah, my philosophy on the top 10 list has always been it's a recommendation engine. Mm-hmm. And so it's not like, oh, this has been crafted in a lab to be perfect. And like, it is the best. These are the best. It's like, no, these are obviously like my favorites that I think will also stand the test of time. But ultimately, like we're like all three of us in our fields are like watching way more than the average person. Right. And so at the end of the year, they're going to be like, okay, what if there are only 10 things that I can watch, if there are only 10, what are they? If we have to just whittle it down and really focus on what is the mo- the best, like what will help me. And like, to me, that's the purpose of the list. It's not to be sort of like, Oh, you know, these, these are the best. And if anyone disagrees, they do not recognize the best. It's like, no, this is what I think. If you have, you know, if you have the time, watch these 10 things. Right. And how do you feel philosophically about the concept of like having the hard 10 versus like letting it drift into like the a 12 to 15 territory? I'm, I, I think to me, the hard 10 is important because again, if it's a recommendation engine, if I start piling on and make it like 15 or 20 or 25, then I've sort of defeated the purpose of someone who was already short on time being like, well, I don't really have time to watch 25 movies, you know? And at that point, they're probably only gonna look at the top 10 anyway. So, you know, and at that point, I think at 25, you're sort of being like, and look how much I saw, and these are the best. And like, I don't know, I always feel like a top 10 should not really be about exalting the person as much as it should be a guide to the reader. Because also like, I will also say like your top 10s, like I've made top 10s every year for film since 2002. And I look back at some of my top 10s and I'm like, those were bad choices. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I got what? it, I got it wrong. I think Seth Rogen tweeted something once uh, to the effect of, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't like do the Oscars until five years later. Mm. And like, you know, you know, every, yeah. every, every year's Oscar ceremony should honor the films from five years ago and figure out like, and see how they've settled and how they've survived the test of time. And it actually becomes a kind of fun exercise. Like if you even just going back five years and looking at what were the nominees, what, what ended up winning and reflecting on how those films have changed and aged over the years, like it is, it, it is, it is fascinating. But I also think like it's worth having the immediacy of that portrait, like, you know, I don't know. It, 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 it's, it's always, there's, there's so many fascinating elements to a, what is theoretically a very simple editorial assignment. <laughs> yeah. I try and kind of go, I mean, uh, more recently I kind of go with my gut, like what moved me, what uh, made me excited about the thing. I'm not trying to get like, 
I'm not trying to gain like critical cred here or anything or have the most esoteric list or even the most like obscure list. Like if it's something popular, but I loved it, you know, let me talk about why I loved it uh, and kind of defend my position. But yeah, I, I like Matt's philosophy of like it is, you know, the best thing. And this is how I feel about the Oscars as well is it's a pageant. But the best thing it can do, same with the Emmys, is get convince people who have not heard of this thing to watch that thing. I think yeah. Unorthodox is the perfect example. I had never heard of it. Uh, I still haven't watched it, but I know a lot of people that uh, are like, oh, you know, I heard about it at the Emmys and I watched it and I loved it. So it's on my radar now, at least. Yeah, no, absolutely. At their best, like those award shows can really like be game changers. Like I think, you know, the example I always go to is like Damien Bashir, like he was in this small film called, um, a, I think it was called A Normal Life. Um, it was anyway, it was just this sort of immigrant drama. And he uh, he was great in it and he got an Oscar nomination for best actor. And like that kind of made his career. And now he gets to be like in Tarantino movies and George Clooney movies and like a bunch of like he was a lead in an FX series. Like, yeah. And I think that's really great because he is a great actor. And I'm going to be kicking myself until I remember what the name of the movie was that he got an Oscar <laughs> nomination. For. A Better Life. A Better Life. Thank you. That, yeah. that sounds that sounds right. Uh, Not to be confused with The Good Year by Ridley Scott. Yeah, <laughs> good luck. Well, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's, I think a really important point, like the fact that, you know, we, we, it is, this is an opportunity to amplify, uh, you know, the great stuff that has been happening, especially because as, you know, even a pandemic has not stopped there from being too much TV. Um, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm just thinking about like, I'm just thinking about in general, just how great, like it can be for somebody who, you know, was playing like a, a you know, like a, a, a guest, a, someone whose, you know, career was relegated to like guest star work on random TV shows. And then all of a sudden, bam, uh, like Charles, Ch Chadwick Boseman, like if you look at his career, like there's like a good solid, like five or six years before he picked, started basically playing every, uh, you know, start, started starring every uh, biopic about a black leader. Uh, he was on Fringe, I think. I think he did. He there. I think there's a Law and Order somewhere in there. I wish I could remember. I I want to look this up honestly, because, but like, you know, it is fast. It is fascinating to see how people's careers can take off. And this is a complete and utter tangent from what we're talking about, which is the best TV of the year. <laughs> but who knows? The best, you know, the best TV show you could watch. You know, the the best TV show of the year could uh, feature uh, a random cameo from someone who will go on to become very famous. Who knows? Um, so Adam, what, as, as you are the person who's watched more TV than Matt, like, <laughs> you know, what, what, what are you going to be mad about not making my top 10 list? Uh, I mean, we have pretty similar top 10 lists. Let me, uh, let me double check yours again. I think there are a couple that, uh, you left off there. I mean, for me, the biggest surprise of the year for me, um, and something that moved me deeply and like kind of upset me was normal people. Uh, which I was not expecting. And my fiance really loved the book. And so we watched it together and it was, it was a really emotional viewing experience. That show is so deeply felt um, as like a relationship drama. It almost reminded me of, I mean, there's a lot of controversy surrounding blue is the warmest color, but in the best moments of that film, it was kind of epically intimate. And that's kind of how normal people felt of putting you in these two characters heads as they were falling in love. Um, and just really getting wrapped up in the emotions of what it is like to be in love um you know no matter the age uh and stuff like that that's one and i think that i that's on your list um yeah right yeah it, it's it, i mean the, 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 my list is currently on un, un, unranked uh yeah. but yeah i mean like and i feel like you know i don't know if, if this this might be just something very particular to me but i feel like if a show makes me cry it has a very good ch a chance of making it onto my list like i feel like you know if if it if it draws out those emotions, if it draws out any real emotion in me, like that means something. But then again, Harley Quinn is definitely on my list. So, uh, <laughs> and not okay. that it didn't, not that it didn't have a lot of emotion in it, but I did. I did find a couple that I am uh, mad online about. Uh, one is the Great, <laughs> which I thought was great. Great is on my think, list. Did, uh, did you watch sure. the Great? I'm Matt? I'm halfway through the great. Okay. Halfway through. <laughs> like that's the thing you also have to keep in mind. I go through these shows very slowly and I will talk a bit later because I forgot that like docu-series count as series. And so yeah. I'll talk about one I Do later they? on in the show. I'll talk about one I really loved and one I really hated. Oh, sure. <laughs> Our oh. listeners know which are know which is which. <laughs> um 
But yeah, so you, you want. Why do you, you hate you, the great? <laughs> Just tell me why great. you hate the great, Liz. The, gr- oh. the great is great. Uh, it's on my long list. Uh, it's it's actually not out of contention officially as a result. Uh, but it's it, it it. I feel like if I was going to. I feel like it, it, for some reason, just because I maybe they came out, both came out on Hulu at, within a similar period of time, like they kind of got conflated in my head. Uh, it, it kind of like gets aligned in my head with normal people, yeah. which I mean, they're both great shows. And I think normal people, I think, was the slightly stronger one. But that doesn't mean both can't be on the list. I just it's such a hard list to make at this point. Um well, and the great got a little like in the middle of the season, it didn't get bad, but it was a little less uh, like explosive of, of those first few episodes. But I did feel like the finale hit a really surprisingly poignant. The finale is very surprising to me, not in like a plot way necessarily, but like an emotional way. Yeah, I think I, I, I do think that it it could have been slightly condensed. Like, I think yeah. you could have gone down. I think it's 10 episodes and I think you could have taken it down to eight and been a little tighter. But I mean, re- but like if I if I if I make a best performances of the year list, like Nicholas Holt's number one with a bullet, that was huzzah. An, huzzah. Huzzah. It's, it's an impossible role. Um, and yeah, so yeah, I definitely that I definitely, dialogue I, sing that profanities is like uh, music. <laughs> it's it's just wonderful. It's it's because so, it's such a fascinating character because you really he's like he has that vulnerability and that knowledge that he's not as smart as he wants to be and not as great as he wants to be, but he's also so in the, in all the layers of it are so great yeah. in the great, <laughs> which never gets uh, old. It never gets old. Uh, I'm also a little surprised the flight attendant is not on this list. You've given me, um, uh, which I, I praised heavily last week on the episode. Yeah. I mean, flight attendant I thought was really fun and it's a really solid thriller. I just feel like it's, I, I, you know what? It, it, I think, I think I'm, I'm just being really, I'm, I'm being really uh, snobby and feeling like it's just a little bit too much of a popcorn thriller for me. Like, I thought it was great, and I thought there was a lot of really well executed elements to it. And I could definitely, I definitely am fascinated to know how a season two will work. Like, yeah. they have the official green light; it's going to happen. Uh, the, the showrunner said a few things about at least what he knows he won't do. Like. There are certain elements from season one that won't be part of season two, allegedly. But yeah, I it's it's a tough one. Uh, and then there was just one. I, well, uh, Umbrella Academy, I really loved, but I can see not putting that on on the top. Whatever. It's a it it's a great Netflix show, and I do mean that as a pejorative <laughs> in terms of like all the episodes kind of blend together, kind of one long story. If you try and pluck out individual like whatever's, it doesn't really work. But I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, I mean, I did too. Uh, I think like I did too, and it's it, yeah, it's, that one's a tough one. It's it was definitely it's also on the long list. Uh, I feel like I, I, I need to. We need the full we, another list. I need to finish is the uh, best shows on Netflix list. But I feel like for me, uh, Haunting of Bly Manor kind of like knocks it out of the top spot. And I was not. I did not go into Haunting of Bly Manor expecting to really love it. And but I still really I still think about that ending all the time. Like it's a beautiful ending. And yeah. I was devastating. It, devastating. It was yeah, it was just I I I really appreciated it for all of its qualities. It, that show was also interesting in that I think a lot of people were expecting a <laughs> horror show and it really was a gothic romance. It pulled right. a crimson peak and people were like, bah, what is this? It's not scaring me. Therefore, yes. it is not good. And I, a giant scary, scaredy cat, was like, yes, this is not scaring me. <laughs> a plus, well done, show. <laughs> um, yeah, I, right now I'm also like kind of grappling personally with uh, this this year of Star Trek we've had. Because, uh, you know, I'm not putting Picard on the best. The, the, Picard was not even on the long list, frankly. I'm still, in, in the more I think about the season finale of Star Trek Picard, the more annoyed I am. Uh, because they, 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 if you, if you haven't seen it, just know they pull a dick move that 100% was, it's just a blatantly dick move. And, uh, I, I, I watched the hell out of season two and there's a lot about season one I really liked, but, uh, you know, they, they did not stick the landing, but Star Trek Discovery has been really fun this season and they've really done a lot of great great development of a, a whole new era of the fran- of the franchise, which if you're a nerd like me, gets very exciting. Uh, and I also really enjoyed Star Trek Lower Decks uh, for, it, it really managed to find a way to do comedy 
in the in the world of Star Trek in ways that occasionally full on made fun of things like J.J. Abrams and Lens Flare. Uh, it's there. There's there's some great stuff in, C, in Lower Decks, and I I don't know if it came together as a complete season as well as I wanted it to, but it was really solid and real uh, really fun. I'm, I, it's another one where I'm like I'm glad that there's going to be more of it. So. That's, I'm still kind of figuring out how Star Trek fits into my look back at the year because there's a lot to there's a lot to respect and acknowledge. Like Star Trek Discovery added a cat. There's a cat on Star Trek Discovery now. It's great. Matt, have you watched any of the Star Trek shows? I haven't because I don't want CBS All Access. <laughs> yes, you don't want to. It, it looks the complete catalog of Caroline in the City is on the Star uh, on, uh, on, on CBS All Access. Don't you want you get your Caroline in the City on? Leah Thompson, it's a, she's a charmer. Um, I did re- finally, re- I did remember, so because this year has blurred together, I just checked something. I do have a favorite show this year that's not on your list, Liz, but I think it's pretty great. But because it came out all the way back in January, okay. I had mostly forgotten about it, is Miracle Workers Dark Ages. Oh, Miracle Workers, yes. that, that was a really fun, I, fun one, for yeah. sure. Um, I really loved that show. Um, it was not just funny, but very sweet, surprisingly yeah. sweet. Um, and that really created a nice mixture there. And I, I, so the kind of show I feel like if it hadn't been on TBS, like, or if it had found its way to like a streamer or something, more people would have been talking about it. Absolutely. And it's on HBO Max right now. So is anyone it? can well, watch I, it. I, I, I think Finally. Season, is season two on or is it just season one? Uh, let me check. I think Dark Ages is on there, although maybe I'm wrong. Um, I certainly, they certainly it launched with the first season of Miracle Workers. And I think honestly, my only problem with Dark Ages was that I liked the first season more. Um, okay. And I haven't if, seen the first season cause they kind of well, like, they basically redid the show. Yeah. And yeah. So you, and you don't need to watch either, but, uh, if you've, if you, if you like Dark Ages, you should check out the first season. It's, okay. it's, it's. It, 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 the all the qualities you just mentioned, like the sweetness, like are even like are amped up a great deal. Like okay. I thought. I thought, I mean, like, Dark Ages was fun. It was just a little nasty at times. Uh, in comparison to the first season, which is a really was really charming. Mm-hmm. Um, I just looked, and only season one is on HBO Max. And we actually went back and watched season one after watching season two. Uh, my fiance liked it. I didn't really like the first season, actually. Oh. I mean, Although maybe it was it like we were watching it right around the time of the election, and there is a lot of existential dread in that first season. Oh, about yeah. the annihilation of the the earth <laughs> so that's maybe totally that something to do with it um yeah what was i gonna say i mean that's the, the you mentioned something about how like if it wasn't on a streamer or something it would it would have a better chance at getting attention and that's something we if, see yeah if it were on a streamer it more people would know about it rather exactly. than basic cable yeah i mean that's the it, it's funny how like in covering tv and like making decisions about what we should put energy into focusing on it is fascinating how basic cable has become like the death zone in some mm-hmm. ways like just because not enough people have cable subscriptions to make it to make it as buzzy as we need like like i i would at the, at this point like if a show premieres if a, if a show premiering on tnt is less interesting to me tr- just in terms of what I think will drive traffic than a show that is on HBO Max uh, or even Peacock. Uh, at least you can get, you get Peacock for free. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's worth every penny. <laughs> it, oh. um, but yeah, I was going to like, but that's going to be the, fu- the funny thing is like uh, there, there's, there are shows like uh, there's an upcoming Netflix is going to have soon the premiere of a show called Dare Me, which originally premiered on USA Network, uh, like right around, right about a year ago. Like, I forget if it was officially like the last week of December or the first week of January, but it was right around this time of the year. And every TV critic I know who watched it, loved it, thought it was one of the best shows they've, one of the best shows, especially about teen, about te- one of the best teen dramas made in a really long time. But because it was on USA Network, it just got no eyeballs. And uh, right now, I'm very, I'm very excited about the possibility that something that something that we've already seen happen at least once in our history, which is, um, you know, the Lifetime series You, uh, got picked, made its made its Netflix debut, became a huge hit for Netflix, and Netflix greenlit a second season. And so there's a very real chance that the same thing could happen for Dare Me, uh, it's coming coming soon to Netflix, soon to be a Netflix original. Speaking of that, I just remembered another show that uh, we watched this year that actually came out this year, but we watched on Netflix, which was Evil. 
which I had heard good things about when it was on CBS. Um, but I was like, eh, like a CBS procedural. I'm not sure I want to watch that. But it is like a full on horror show that was on CBS. That is a it's that classic procedural of like science versus faith. So Katja Herbers is um, I think she's like a psychologist. And then um, Mike Coulter, who's Luke Cage, uh, is like a priest in training. And Asif Manvi is like a tech guy. And together, the three of them investigate like uh, actual like exorcisms and stuff for the Catholic Church. So Katja Herber's character, you know, doesn't care much for and doesn't really believe in it. But she's there to be like an objective observer. But there is like a season long arc with her character that I thought was really compelling. I think she's a really compelling actress. I was like, where do I know her from? I was like, oh, yeah, completely wasted on Westworld. That's it. <laughs> but and Michael was, Emerson's the bad guy, right? Yes. And mm-hmm. Michael Emerson is the bad guy, is uh, an evil person. Um, it's just yeah. super weird. And it's only 10 episodes. And it feels like something that would air on FX or something. It felt really bold to me. And it's the same creators of like The Good Wife, right? Yes. The the, uh, Robert, uh, yeah. Uh, Robert and Michelle King. Uh, who have a legacy, actually, of making these weird little shows under the CBS umbrella and getting a like and, you know, look, they they made the good wife for CBS. And so CBS has kind of given them. And we, by the way, and by the way, the good wife would force for a CBS legal procedure was actually a pretty weird show in many respects. Yeah. Um, if all, it, like just randomly for things like uh, no show has understood the Internet better than the good wife. Uh, and then that continued on to the good fight. Like they, they really understand how to take concepts like that and tra- take, you know, concepts like that and translate them for, for, for episodes. But yeah. Um, yeah. Evil's great. Uh, and if you, if you like that, you should check out brain dead, uh, which was, <laughs> I think, I think you can watch it on CBS all access. <laughs> and uh, Trying to sell a CBS all access subscription. I'm just, I'm going to say uh, brain dead was, it was a summer series that uh, CBS ran that it, it, it but that the kings produced and i my memory of it's a little dim i just remember it involved aliens taking over the government by in you know eating their eating the brains of elected officials uh including tony shaloub like tony <laughs> shaloub starred in the show as one of the as a politician who becomes uh possessed by an alien and uh, is trying to take over the world so I feel like, oh, and, and uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead was the charming young lead. Uh, oh. It was an early Mary Elizabeth Winstead role. So, uh, re- uh, recommend it all around. Uh, Speaking so, of weird stuff, what did you guys think of Devs? Or did you did you watch Devs, Matt? I didn't. I didn't watch Devs. I don't, I don't <laughs> you don't fuck time. with Alec Gar- Alex Garland anymore. I like. I'll watch an Alex. Like, we had this conversation about like there are the, these directors like i love their movies and if they make a movie i'm there for it but they're like i made an eight episode series and i'm like i'll see you later <laughs> like i should i should have seen little drummer girl by now because i love that cast and it's park chan wook <laughs> i haven't seen it <laughs> hit me with your next movie park well also i mean a little drummer girl i don't know where you can watch that because it was it would be on amc plus right i tried um, to so watch I- that i couldn't get past for epi- first episode uh, i love park chan wook I, mean, I think I think like yeah, Devs was Devs was so much Alex Gar- the show Alex Garland wanted to make and God bless him for it. Like no one <laughs> no one can question whether or not Alex Garland had to make any compromises whatsoever while making Devs. So yeah, but, you know congratulations to that man. If you if you loved the third act of Annihilation, watch Devs. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, but I I don't want to I, I don't know how much longer we can keep talking, but I do want Matt to. Talk about the one docu series he really, really hated, and then. But I, I first want to hear about the one you really loved. What I really loved was "I'll Be Gone in the Dark," um, okay. because I felt like it really upended the true crime um, genre. Because we've been really inundated with true crime docu series for a while, and I feel like what that one did that was different was, first off, it, it was able to weave Michelle McNamara's story into what she was writing. And um, for those who don't know, she was a uh, uh, crime uh you know journalist and she was tracking the this uh serial rapist and then serial killer that she dubbed the golden state killer um and what it does differently is that it doesn't make it really about the killer it's not really obsessed with who are they where do they come from like you'll get you get a bit of that at the end but it's really very sympathetic towards victims and the process of like and also like but also like what does you know 
working this kind of case as just an independent person due to per like if you like Zodiac, there's that kind of element there, of like the toll that it takes to sort of, you know, go explore that much darkness. And I think the way that the series adapted her book uh, was really gave me insight, not just into the case that she was working, but her as an individual. And so I was really impressed with, um, with what they did with that docuseries. I, I love that you mentioned you talk about it in that way because it makes me think about how I think in general this this year has been a time when we're starting to talk more about the emotional toll of doing these difficult sorts of jobs. I'm thinking specifically about healthcare workers and how there's a whole new conversation happening about you know their mental health and what we can do to help support them. And yeah, so uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I watched I watched that series as well, and I don't normally go for true crime, but I thought it was very affecting, and I thought the fact that it the fact that it was really grounded in her personal in her story versus uh, you know the killers like is you know I think that's honestly the, I don't care about I, I, that that's the sort of the, when it's focused on the killer that's why I don't care about true crime that's when I don't care about true crime stories and yeah. this was the opposite approach yeah and by focusing think, so much on the victims it also sort of created this narrative of you know that these people were like had the worst thing happen to them and yet they were resilient enough to sort of they're still here they're still worthwhile they don't necessarily have to be defined by this horrible thing as the only thing about them one thing that I can't stop thinking about that show as well, in terms of the victims, so many of the interviews, it was just women. And there was one couple that was still together. But you think about like the fragility of men in those situations and like how men react to trauma differently to women and, you know, almost blaming the woman or like, you know, just walking away and I can't deal with it. I don't know. I found that really striking as as we were watching the show. And the one couple that was together, the man was there. You could tell he was very emotionally available. Mm -hmm. And it was still hard for him to discuss everything that happened. But he was you could tell there was a couple that was having open and honest emotional conversations. Whereas you can kind of imagine in some of these other situations, they may have, you know, let's not speak of it. And then that creates a fracture and, you know, broken apart. Yeah. So I found that really striking as well. It's definitely it's 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 a it's a strong change of pace from the true crime genre. Right. Um, uh, speaking so. of get it out, get it out. Get so off. another true crime docuseries from HBO <laughs> this year was The Vow, which was garbage. It was let, let me say one of my favorite uh Sunday night rituals was seeing you tweet about how much you hate the vow, but how you were watching the vow. <laughs> Yeah, Every I, Sunday night, I knew I could count on a Matt tweet to show up in the timeline of like, I'm watching The Vow. I hate The Vow. I, I, it got to the point where I would start watching the screeners because I, I, I was getting screeners and I would be like watching them being like, oh, Matt's going to hate this. Part. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and, then, and then we were so shocked that HBO wouldn't get give you screeners for the finale. It was the weirdest thing. We couldn't figure out why <laughs> that might have happened. Come on, guys. <laughs> What could possibly what, what 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 could possibly give them pause when in, in giving you screener access? Yeah. So yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember like what was my like I was watching like a good show. I feel like I was watching a good show that led led into a bad show with the like I can't remember what I was watching. Oh, what was that? No, I that's was what it was. Perry Mason. <laughs> no, no, I was watching Lovecraft Country. Oh, and I yeah. was with that for the premiere, and then that show dropped off. But then I still stuck with The Vow because at that point it became a hate watch. And I was just, uh, you know, The Vow, for those who don't know, it's it's theoretically following the Nexium cult and right. sort of how that came to be. But it is so, its attention is so scattershot. It is so enamored of its subjects that it never pushes them or questions them. It's a It's sort of a documentary made from the inside out. And that's a bad way to make a documentary like that about it, sort of this about a cult, because you end up being sort of as indoctrinated as the people who think that they are sort of awakened now, but are not willing to do the work of their own complicity beyond the most shocking elements. Like at no point in the vow does anyone question like, oh, yeah, we're this like, yeah, it's a sex cult and that's bad. Also, this is a Ponzi scheme. Like, and no point does anyone ever bring that up. And then, you know, spoilers ahead for The Vow, I guess. Um, it's like, you know, Keith Raniere, the head of this cult, is a horrible person. 
He's terrible. Uh, but also we're going to talk to him next season. So come back because <laughs> we haven't given him enough time yet. And then like I went on, like there are things that this documentary doesn't even like get into. Like there are some very mysterious deaths mm-hmm. linked to Nexium. They didn't go there. So it's like, it's a lazy, poorly made flabby documentary. Check out I, season two in 2021, <laughs> I guess. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll spin, I'll, 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 put, I'll, I'll springboard off to say that uh, since we are theoretically talking about the best TV of the year, um, I got really hooked on the vow early on. Like I was watching the screeners and just was like, oh, sh-. yeah, basically I, I just remember I was watching them on my iPad one morning and I was like, huh, four hours have gone by on this beautiful Saturday and I'm still watching the vow. Uh, so I didn't hate it the way you did. Uh, but I will say that if you have an opportunity to watch uh, Seduced, which is uh, Stars's version, it's A, four hours long, so it's much shorter. It's very specifically focused on two key players who do are a factor in, who do play a part in the, in the vow, but it's much more focused on the mother-daughter relationship between uh, Catherine Oxenbridge. And her daughter, her, India. And her daughter, India. I'm just not sure if I got the last name right. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's it's a much better documentary. It's much tighter. And uh, it, 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 it's it's very interesting to watch it after watching the vow and seeing like Mark Vicente uh, there gets a very kind edit in the vow and a not so kind edit in seduced like yeah he gets a very kind edit in the vow because it's largely his he's supplying the footage yeah. and the recordings so you know and again you're too intertwined with your subject to be to cast a critical eye towards them and at that point you're just kind of doing PR mm-hmm. yeah so. I mean and I feel like that's yeah, there's a lot. The, the Seduce is definitely worth checking out. If, if I was, I one of the things I tend to do when I'm making a top 10 list for the year is immediately just kind of focus it in on scripted television, which yeah. means I do end up looking overlooking certain things, but uh, it's also necessary for my sanity. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, like there, there, there were some great docuseries this year for sure, and I'm glad we talked about them here. So are there any, so uh, one show that I know that is on your list, Liz, and I right. do want to talk about it and I'm still not done with it yet because I'm, I'm, it's not a show that I like, it's bad. It's that I'm savoring it and I don't want it to be over is Ted Lasso. Oh yeah. I, I, I adore Ted Lasso, not just because it's a feel good show, but it's also an incredibly funny show too. So oh, funny. absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, I, um, I'm going to give full credit to Jeff Snyder, who was uh, the first person I knew to watch uh, the Ted Lasso screeners. And he was like, this is going to be, re- this is really great. And uh, I then, ch- I, so based on that, I checked them out. I was like, yeah, this is just delightful. And yeah, it's, it, it, the fact that it's so aggressively went for, it, it's so, it's, it's aggressive almost. And just like, we are just going to be nice. And uh, this was definitely the year for that. Uh so I, I'm very excited about a season two. I love the fact that it's uh, really putting, it really like celebrated the entire cast. Uh, it's a great cast. There's a lot of funny bits. I can't, I, I, have you gotten to the Wrinkle in Time episode yet? Yes. <laughs> that delighted me so much. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, I, I, I feel very strongly that Ted Lasso will be in my top 10. Um, I I can say I'm I am fairly certain it's my favorite television show of the year. And wow. I came to it late. We watched it last month, I think. Uh and I watched it in an entire weekend and was immediately upset with myself <laughs> because I was like there's no more Ted Lasso to watch. Um yeah. but it's striking in that like it's very funny. It's also very cinematic. I think it's it's really well shot and well made. Um but it's got it like it's about non-toxic masculinity in a really healthy way. Like it's about men being able to be masculine um, in a really non-toxic way, like about, you know, competition and uh, teams and these kind of worlds that traditionally, uh, you know, uphold this idea of like, you know, brute and ego. Um, And Ted Lasso is kind of like butting into those, uh, which is just a really bold idea, I thought, but one that's really tough to execute, but I thought it nailed it perfectly. Um, And we have enough stories about men, but I just thought this was like a unique, like non-toxic masculinity is not a thing that like shows are about usually, Mm -hmm. um, or they'll have like a side thing about it or something. But I also really liked how it acknowledged like Ted Lasso is the most positive human being in the world. And that's delightful and that's fun and it's refreshing. But it also acknowledges like this is also taxing on the people around him. And also what does that toll that takes on Ted himself? What happens when he is challenged 
you know, with that positivity and, and how does that come up? I think one of my favorite episodes of the year is, is it called Liverpool? The one in Liverpool, uh-huh. um, where they go to Liverpool. Um, and just really tremendous work by Jason Sudeikis, I thought. Um, I don't know, it's constantly surprising, but also like the comedic bits are so well executed. The the puns and the physical comedy and the way he's hitting on those puns, going back and forth beard with the, you know, his his coach. What's the first rule of Fight Club? Just... No Fight Club! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's just so good. And it, it is well worth, um, I know people don't want to buy Apple TV plus, but I would say, a, if you're getting uh, a new Apple device as like a gift for the holidays or whatever, you get a year of it for free. So prioritize Ted Lasso, but B, if you're gonna do a free trial over the holiday break with family or whatever, it is well worth doing that just to watch Ted Lasso. Yeah. I would say target your free break, uh, to also, uh, make time for Dickinson. Uh, because Dickinson season two will be premiering at the beginning of 2021. Uh, and so it is not officially a show we are talking about on this podcast, but uh, it, Dickinson is another good one. Also, um, I, another show that also kind of dug into the question of you know toxic masculine, masculinity in the video game world was Mythic Quest, Raven's Banquet, which, I sh- which was a show that really surprised me uh, for how much I enjoyed it. And the quarantine episode it did uh, back in May is to date, I think, still one of the best quarantine episodes we've gotten. And a lot of people have tried and failed to pull that off. I have not seen that yet, but I need to watch it. Uh, you know, I watched The Morning Show, so I yeah. owe it to myself to watch Mythic Quest for Raven's Bank. I yeah. mean, F. Murray Abraham plays a... Uh, F. Murray Abraham, first off, is on the show, uh, which should be enough, for, for, enough to inspire interest. But also he plays a uh you know older older writer of science a classic science fiction so like all that gross uh all all that fantastic uh like ray bradbury era like sci-fi stuff gets a a good a good workout in terms of parody topics that that was almost a sentence i'm sorry (laughs) and uh it's not a tv show but if you do get that apple tv plus trial check out boy state which is a really good really good documentary yeah um, so I guess, you know, we're like, uh, you know, I don't want us to run too long. Do we want to like try to, I, I for me, I, I don't feel like I can do like a top three TV shows, um, because it would only be three TV shows. So it's not like there was like, I, I not the vow. Okay. The three <laughs> other shows that I watched were Ted Lasso, I'll be gone in the dark and miracle workers. Yeah, so there you go. You, that's a, that's a good top three. I don't, Is it a top a, three when like you saw four shows is what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> that's the question I'm asking. The thing, the, thing, the, 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 the honest truth is that I would defend all three of those picks. So right. like uh, if for, for, if for a list that is my, my long list for the record is 31 shows. So, uh, you know, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of TV, but I fully, I fully, I fully endorse your list. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, let's what Liz, what's what, like, I, I don't want you to spoil anything, but do you want to like give some shows that are in your running for your top three? Uh, yeah, I will say that. I mean, I'll, I'll talk about shows that we haven't talked about. Okay. Which, um, I will say Bojack Horseman, I thought nailed the finale, which is an important thing for a show to like that to do. I, uh, I feel really strongly that Better Call Saul deserved a lot more attention for its uh, latest season than it deserves. And can we pause there for a second and just say Better Call Saul is fucking amazing? And yeah, like, it's gonna end, and people are gonna be like, "Ah, oh, we missed <laughs> we missed this show that it, you know I'd argue is better than Breaking Bad." Oh yeah, in- no, it, it's it's I mean it's it's it states better than Breaking Bad is. Is, is, is you know it's true, but it's only it's largely because it's been able to build on what Breaking Bad built yeah, yeah. over the years. Like, mm-hmm. um, and then uh, I, be, by the power invested in me, I I'm strongly considering Legends of Tomorrow uh, for a top five slot at the very least on my list, Pro- and it could get in the top three. Uh, <clears throat> maybe, <clears throat> either either Legends of Tomorrow or the Babysitters Club. Quite frankly, I thought. The Babysitters Club did something, did a lot of things really well this season, <clears throat> in its first season. Goodness, and uh, it deserves it, it. It it deserves all the attention for not just being a good show for young women, but just a great show. That show is very sweet. Yeah. So, Adam, what about you? What would be in the running for your top three? Uh, I mean, Ted Lasso, Normal People, 
and then you know take your pay probably better call Saul. um yeah i'd probably put better call Saul in there with those three because uh, yeah the emotional complexity and what they're doing like there is not a better directed show in television than better call Saul. i don't think just in terms of uh, you know the the performances the way they're telling the story with the visual language and it's just people talking, I think is just really tremendous. Every time I watch it, I'm like, I'm going to move to New Mexico someday. <laughs> it's really nice out there. So. I actually went uh, <clears throat> to the Better Call Set Saul, uh, Better Better Call Saul set once in New Mexico, and it is actually it's very empty. It's, it's yeah. it, it, you can see why like it's a show that really embraces quiet because it is often like it, it just that that really does come out of that desert environment i was there for a set visit for a different film but it was the same lot because we could see the los pollos hermanos trucks in the parking lot nice yeah uh, and they had like snake wranglers out there like even though you were on like a studio which i think it was the studio that netflix was buying or had bought um mm -hmm. that giant facility they're like yeah there's a bunch of snakes around here <laughs> so just watch out <laughs> nice. avoid the snakes yeah um so before I, before I let you all go, I actually am, had one more question. Is there a show in 2021 or, or more than one show that you're really looking forward to? Let me pull up my spreadsheet. Harry um, Mason season two. You son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I liked Perry Mason. I enjoyed it. I will say I'm really, you know, I'm really excited for WandaVision. I think that's going to be mm. really, that's, I, if they can pull that off, I think it'll be a really exciting component of the Marvel universe and also just a really fun show on it in its own, in, in, on its own level. Um, and also, uh, what was, uh, oh yeah, uh, there's a, a sci-fi series called Resident Alien that, sh that promises to be a lot of fun. I watched the pilot like a year ago. Um, for because it, it was a, a TCA show, uh, but then they didn't premiere it until decided not they decided to hold it until January. Uh, but it's uh, you know Alan Tudyk is giving a really fun performance as basically a, a alien who f arrives in a small Colorado town and starts helping to solve crime. And there's a there's a bigger mystery to the whole element of it, but the cast is really good and yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. What about you, Matt? Uh, so I'm looking forward to one and maybe two Brian K. Vaughn shows that are coming. Uh, first up is Why the Last Man, which is... is it, you, you, you say it's coming, but... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's the thing. Who knows? It's supposed to come this year, and then they recast the lead role. And, you know, who knows when Why the Last Man will show up. But I, Why the Last Man was like the comic book that got me into comics. Like, right. I didn't know that comics could be that until I read Why the Last Man. And I just think it's very well done. The, pl the premise, for those who don't know, is that uh, there's a plague that wipes out every male mammal on Earth, except for this guy, Yorick Brown, and his monkey, who is named Ampersand. Um, and that's, and sort of like, they're kind of like, kind of going on. So it's a post-apocalyptic drama, but it's really, it has some, it has some levity to it. It has some, it's, it's really well done. And so I'm very curious what they're going to do with the series? Well, they're um, only on their they're only on their second showrunner. Uh, so right, far, exactly. So what well, could I'm possibly also, go wrong? I'm also worried because the last Brian K. Vaughn show that got adapted was Runaways, and I thought that was very disappointing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was not thrilled with Runaways. So I'm kind of I, I'm I, but I'm still like why holds a special place in my heart. Right. Um, and then the other Brian K. Vaughn adaptation, and I don't know if that's going to it's going to arrive in 2021, but Amazon has picked it up is Paper Girls, which if you've read the books, Paper Girls is like Stranger Things, but good. Um, it's these four uh, teenage girls in the 80s who get transported, who start going on a basically a time travel adventure. Um, and it's just very well done. Uh, the relationships, you really buy into them. Uh, the sci fi premise is really done, really well done. So I think Paper Girls could be something special if it's done right. Uh, well, I can tell you that I believe I follow the, sh one, the one of the showrunners of uh, Paper Girls on Twitter, and he tweeted something to the effect, to, I think just like in the last 24 hours or so about like, oh, yeah, we're still working on this uh, with like a fun <laughs> with like a fun photo. And uh, to bring everything full circle, what the sa this, this showrunner is also one of the uh, co-creators of Halt and Catch Fire. There you go. So I am excited. it all it all comes it all comes together. Uh, Adam, what are you looking forward to in 2021? 
Uh, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to know. I don't have anything in front of me <laughs> to remind me of like what's actually coming. I do think WandaVision is going to be a pretty big deal. Um, but in the interest of stumping for my hometown, there are uh, FX actually today just picked up Reservation Dogs, which is a new FX uh, half hour comedy series. It's written by a guy named Sterling Harjo, who is a, an Oklahoma native and a filmmaker from Oklahoma who is friends with Taika Waititi, I suppose, uh, and teamed up with him. Uh, and Taika was supposed to direct this pilot here in Oklahoma, but because of COVID, he's in Australia. And so Sterling Harjo directed the the um, pilot. But it's uh, the official logline is this. Reservation Dogs follows four native teenagers in rural Oklahoma who spend their days committing crime and fighting it. And it's right. written by Taika Waititi and Sterling Harjo. And it's uh, it just it's about like Native American teenagers living on a reservation uh, in modern day, uh, just kind of kicking around. So I think it should be pretty fun. Uh, you know, it, it sounds like it's uh, it could be a thing for FX. So we'll see. Very cool. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you all so much for for listening to this. Uh, if you want to keep up with us, you should follow us on Twitter. Uh, Liz, where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Lizlet. That's L I Z L E T. And Adam, where can people find you? At Adam Chitwood. And you can find me at Matt Goldberg. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll be back with you next week.